This is the Police is the kind of game that has a very striking style and sticks to it. Not the most unambiguous introduction I could have made, but it's the first thing that accurately describes this title. How else can I label a game that on every launch blares out? Usually, before I go shaking my t- Bird name I can't mention in front of children or YouTube's algorithm in case my channel will ever be monetized. It's a noir cop story with an intricate plot and John St. John as the leading voice actor, so you can see where the interest came from. So I thought to myself that a double featurette would not be the worst of ideas. It would have been a shame to just look at one intriguing game at a time, right? Having a fresh memory of the first will be very useful when discussing the second anyway. Yeah, yeah, there's also a third sort of spin-off, but I drew the arbitrary rules of choosing content for this channel and I'm sticking to them. Well, without any further ado, let's see what we've got. This is the police puts you in the shoes of Jack Boyd, the 60-year-old police chief of the fictional city of Freeburg in the equally fictional country of the United States. With his department rocked by a corruption scandal starring his deputy, Jack is 180 days from retirement. The mayor already has a successor lined up, his own son if you could believe it, and he wants these six months to pass scandal free in the sleaziest politician speech you get to witness unless you're a card carrying member of a local party. 180 days of quiet, Jack. That's all I need. I don't have any problems with you, and you won't have any problems with me. But our man is looking at dipping his hands in the proverbial honey jar and making his retirement go smoothly with half a million dollars to his name. Boy's been turning a blind eye to Freebird's corruption for his whole career and his retirement plan is meant to be the middle finger to all that. I can assure you this time it's not my convoluted way of writing scripts that gives this impression, the game really does throw the entire kitchen sink from the get go. Indeed we're talking about 10 minutes of cutscenes full of dialogue opening the game's story, with little to no input from the player. And already we're juggling with 3 significant themes. Only after this you get your first glimpse of the gameplay, which is a very telling hint of where the priorities were while developing This is the Police. The gameplay consists of handling the day-to-day -day activity of your police force. Each day you're presented with all sorts of events that require sending some of your officers. Sometimes it's a robbery, other times it's a case of public disturbance or a murder, all of them need the attention of your force to keep everyone happy. The better qualified the police officers you send, the more likely they will successfully solve the issue. You drag cards, click send and watch the police car go, that's the extent of your contribution. Each cop can have different hidden traits which primarily affect how likely they are to either be drunk or skip work that day. The game attempts to give each person a sense of character, but the limited lines of text they blurt out when they make excuses prevent that from happening. This isn't where the writer's focus was anyway, so it's no biggie. It's not a very involved experience as you might imagine, but it doesn't mean it's bland either. The size of your police force is limited, so you must be careful with how many people you send on each call. These aren't the only things that require the presence of your people either. You've got favors you can perform for some financial gains, a local business here, a mafia interest there, wealthy businessmen somewhere else, things like that. You know, like an honest tax funded police force is supposed to do. Uh, not all of these activities are guaranteed to be worth it though. In some cases you lose good cops because they quit, either because they're revolted by your actions or enticed by the life of easy money you put them in contact with. Okay, sometimes they die to bees while moving a beehive, it happens to the best of us, okay? Later you start delving into criminal investigations that come with their own sweet mechanic. You get your crime report and some initial clues and then you send your detectives to gather more evidence. Evidence comes in the form of picture cards which you have to pick in the correct order to accurately recreate the line of events. While some of them are somewhat bullshit in their deceptiveness, the overall mechanic is welcome. It's the most cop-like thing you get to do and would consider it the best part of the gameplay. The cases are varied in complexity and scenarios and all have the common trait of making you pay attention to the finer details as you try to solve them. Even better, they can turn into full-fledged takedowns of criminal enterprises. 
Some of the people you arrest can be turned into informants, but you gotta work for it. Either you successfully interrogate them with the help of their personal file, or go Guantanamo Bay on their asses and hope you break their spirit before their bodies. It's almost a shame that these criminal gang investigations are rare, because they're certainly more interesting than the dispatcher work you perform the rest of the time. It's a bit unfair to go that far now that I'm thinking it. In reality, the police management component is not that important, it's just window dressing. Sure, it earns you some money and influences your relationship with the city hall, your subordinates and the mafia. These things are relevant. Not very much though. The only case where gameplay influences the ending you get involve failing at levels that would make others question how you were able to turn on your PC to begin with. It suffers from a severe case of autopilot once you get enough cups at high level to handle all the city can throw at you. And the devs were aware of this because on multiple occasions they threw established rules in the trash bin. Don't believe me? After your initial days you're put in contact with the Mafia and you get to choose whether to help them or not. If you choose yes, you stand in to earn a lot of money if you ignore certain crimes. Do that often and the city hall's opinion of you suffers, somewhat. You see, it's not that much of a choice since they're already delighted with your well-oiled case solving machine you've already set up. In the rare instances their opinion of you gets very low, you can max it out in just one or two good days with successful solved cases. So to make things harder, the game throws a mob war in which you have to take sides with even more events that ask for your officer's precious time. Which is a concern precisely for two days because that's how long it takes to put the side you support in front enough to not bother for the rest of the so-called war. What a shame. But hey, now the game sends Jack Boyd into a coma, and on his return all his force is drained of energy. Oh, and the cops refuse to go alone because violence broke out in the city. I mean, the game says it broke out because the calls you answer are not much more violent than before. But you recover relatively quickly, so the game throws in a serial killer plotline with a unique investigation chain. Do you see what I mean? This isn't even the first whole half of the game because it keeps going. I don't mind all the twists, but I mind the reason they exist. Between each change, the game's pace grinds to a halt with entirely uneventful days. Without a hitch, the game follows the same sequence. First it throws a bunch of things at you, gets your blood pumping with new concepts, and slowly gets to a point where nothing happens, only to once again unload a lot of new things to start the cycle again. And you get to play through most of the titular 180 days until retirement, so the hopes of the game letting you go easy are in vain. The the developers understood the need to mix things up to avoid the monotony, but did not notice that the main culprit is the terrible pacing that does the heaviest lifting in the wrong department. Things like the poker games are supposed to alleviate the monotony, but they're not helping much. As someone who played hours of poker in Red Dead Redemption 2 for no real reason, this is the police doesn't bring much to the table. Primarily because the extremely poor AI that either mysteriously falls on checks or magically raises their own called rays. Oh, and this particular opponent instantly falls at the slightest bet when he doesn't have anything on hand. Meaning that I have to milk his money for half an hour doing just this. Compared to this, people who go all in in their first hand in play money tournaments are poker masters. Played this once, took a cool $90,000 and then never bothered with it. I'd rather slowly reach boredom with the dispatcher tasks than be actively annoyed by this poor implementation of a card game. But when it comes to the story, this is the police is hitting really high notes. You want to see more of Jack's monologues and witness his transformation as the story continues. You bear through the stretches where nothing happens because the cutscenes are worth the wait. John St. John's voice acting certainly adds to the experience, but the writing quality makes the story and the whole game work. At the start of the game, Jack Boyd is a deflated man, spiritually trained by decades spent in an unfulfilling career. He's been slumping away to a mediocre retirement, while everyone around him reaped all the benefits of the corrupt system surrounding him. His wife left him and throughout the story he's trying to refill the gaping hole. 
When he finally gets a chance to meet her, he gets mugged in the streets and put in a coma. As he wakes up, a switch goes off in his head and he finally starts putting up a fight. The story really picks up from here, I was actually worried I'm gonna have to witness an old man going into retirement as the entire premise. He starts having a love interest with Lana, a young prosecutor and an essential character for the rest of the story. But even so, his desire to find his wife remains, and the conclusion of that arc is very well done. No, I will not spoil something so important, that's all you're gonna get from me. Ironically, as good as John St. John is as a voice actor, I initially had my doubts he was a good fit. His booming baritone voice didn't seem to gel with the role of a defeated, broken-spirited old man. But as things progressed and Jack started putting up a fight, the casting began to make much more sense. I think the best way to describe some of the scenes is badass. I'm Freeberg's police chief. I came to work. Stop trying to get in my way. But he's also very able to convey the deep sadness of the character, make no mistake. How can you not remember? It's important, Laura. It's... it's important. Without spoiling anything, I have to commend This is the Police for how many plates it manages to balance at the same time in terms of story elements. The way multiple plots are weaved around each other helps create an intriguing story, but ironically it also leads to more pacing issues. Wait, do you hear that? It's the song of the past arguments! Without a hitch, the game follows the same sequence. First, it throws a bunch of things at you, gets your blood pumping with new concepts, and slowly gets to a point where nothing happens, only to once again unload a lot of new things to start the cycle again. Wow, it's been so long since I've uttered those words. The story is definitely the best part of the game, but it too suffers from what's essentially a design issue. Instead of crafting a more focused experience, this is the police attempts to put as much as it can on the back of something that really, really wants to be a police management game. As a concept, this sounds pretty hype, but it just drags the entire game down when it falls flat. Because it wants to portray the motions of day-in, day-out police chief business, it insists on having a lengthy playthrough to its detriment. Playing the role of a dispatcher works for only so much time if you're looking for an engaging experience. Afterwards, it becomes the annoying thing that you have to put up with between story moments that feel way too far apart to keep you engaged. Did I mention that there's no way to speed up time and you're forced to endure sometimes minutes of nothingness if little to no calls come over a day? It's a shame because the story is well written with fascinating characters and terrific voice work. If the boring parts were compressed, the plot has enough ability to keep you glued to your seat. I had genuine one more turn moment solely because of it, but the boredom hits harder and harder each time it takes root. That's why I'm not interested in touching the sandbox mode. Sure, it provides a randomized gameplay loop with increased difficulty and a leaderboard to compete against, but what I said before still applies. You're playing This is the Police for the characters and the story, and in this sense it's delivering in spades. There's another side of the coin I have to mention. This is the Police and its sequel are both available on mobile phones, and in this case, my issue with the gameplay is not that relevant, I feel. This comes from someone who does his gaming exclusively on PC, so maybe I'm underestimating the complexity and depth mobile gamers expect. But to my eyes, it looks like the perfect game to play on a long commute or during short lunch break. The long cutscenes can be an issue, but at least they can be skipped. Now that I've finished talking about the original game, let's see what the sequel has to offer. This is the Police 2 takes place roughly one year after the first game. Jack Boyd is now hiding since his corrupt dealings caught up with him. His location of choice is Sharpwood, another fictional town in some sort of parallel world Minnesota. I think. Look guys, nobody has the accent despite giving intense Fargo vibes, give me a break. Anyway, this small town's police department has been rocked by the death of its sheriff and multiple officers. The new sheriff, Lily Reed, is in way over her head. But lo and behold, the mother of all coincidences brings Jack Boyd into her prison cell with an offer to run her police force in exchange for not turning him in to the feds. Sounds contrived, but it works well enough to get the ball rolling. 
The last game needed 10 minutes to portray the introduction, so you might be surprised to hear that this stage takes roughly 1 hour here. While most of it involves dialogue, it also contains exciting gameplay tidbits that made me raise my eyebrows. It's normal seeing sequels fixing issues, but it's not very often when I get to say that many of my complaints have been addressed. Not all are perfect, but it's much more than I expected. The police dispatcher work is still there, but it's got enormous improvements. So many in fact, I'm not sure where to start. Overall, the whole experience is definitely more engaging. Before, many of your calls were automatically resolved with few options presented that did not seem to change a lot. Here, every call involves choosing the next step for your cops to pursue and said choices are relevant. Not only because overall the game is more difficult, which I'll get to later, but because they rely on attributes or inventory of the cop performing said action. Yes, cops are not just some faces with numbers printed above their heads. They have six attributes which help them perform various actions better. Some prompts spell outright the attribute required, but in many cases it's up to you to decide if an action needs a good negotiator or a strong guy or someone who's fast. The relevance of the attributes extends to the small favors you'll get to use them for. So long to sending your weakest cops for guaranteed results, now you have to pick the right man for the job, carefully according to what is required of them. What makes officers have distinct identities doesn't stop here. They now have multiple hidden attributes reflected in their actions or willingness to follow orders. Some officers are misogynists and refuse to go on call alongside women. Others have superiority complexes and refuse to work with low-rank cops. You've got instances of cops refusing to go on multiple successive calls and many more quirks. The best part is that they stay consistent, so you can remember which officer has which preference in terms of people to work with. The first game also had this in the late game with political preferences, but despite being warned that cops with different opinions don't work well together, I never saw the consequences in practice. Here, these mismatches do an excellent job of throwing a wrench into your efforts to satisfy the calls that sometimes bombard your dispatcher. It doesn't help that now there's an obligatory skill level of the crew you send on each call. Even calls that seem fake require a certain amount of overall professionalism level to be able to send a police car. Consequently, it becomes pretty challenging to juggle with the police force at your disposal. In the early game it was the low numbers that led to this, but in the late game you can get really screwed by cops that are picky with their teammates. To add another element, now criminal investigations are performed by regular cops instead of detectives, who were a separate category of employees, and the investigations themselves received a major overhaul and managed to create an even better experience than in the first game. Firstly, the files themselves have multiple clues that you're not guaranteed to find right away. After the preliminary report, at the beginning of each day you can assign up to three officers to investigate for more clues and the suspect's involvement, because each case has multiple suspects and you need to investigate and indict the one you believe fits the best with the clues you have. Some clues are very obvious, but with others it's not hard to be sent on false leads and waste your officer's time following them. You can even indict the wrong person, but fortunately Unfortunately, you're allowed to follow the correct lead and put the right person behind bars. And thank goodness, there are no more requirements to send the main detective to have better odds of catching the suspects. It was a very tedious element of the first game that wasn't really improving the experience. There's something you get to see right from the start of the introduction which I haven't mentioned until now. The game includes a turn-based tactical mode where you can witness a less complex take on XCOM's gameplay. I swear where I'm not intentionally looking for games that do this. As you might guess already, I'm a bit hot and cold on this aspect of This is the Police 2, but before that, credit where it's due. It's not dull and makes quite a few choices outside of it relevant. These on the ground operations don't take place often. I want to say fortunately because they sometimes take a lot of time despite what I just said above. Above, yeah, right. I'm reading the script and I'm saying above. Mm -hmm. 
You already spend more time each day because you have more calls requiring more input from you. If you add a special operation, it can easily clock more than one hour each. I wouldn't call it a negative necessarily, but people who want to play the game in short bursts might find this challenging. These operations come in multiple flavors, but they all involve gathering intelligence before sending boots on the ground. You can find out how many suspects there are, locations of traps, access points and so on. The cops' attributes play an essential role in these missions. With each assigned point, they gain access to a new perk that gives them a wide range of tactical options. They can climb high walls, pick locks, interrogate arrested suspects and many more. There's a problem though. For some very contrived reason, you can only choose 4 perks on each cop at the start of the mission. Beyond the fear of making cops too overpowered, there's no discernible reason to implement such a limitation. The idea that a cop can choose if he's able to forcefully open doors or break windows or not at the start of each mission is dumb and gamey. I get it, it's very easy to make cops powerful because attribute points are received so easily. But have you thought about making attribute points harder to earn if it's such an issue? It's an annoying limitation because in some instances you can effectively soft lock your progress if you're not careful. Take this mission for instance, an assault on a compound with two buildings. One of them is only accessible by vaulting over a fence with no doors to unlock or break as an alternative. Hence it requires an officer with that perk assigned during the mission's preparation. But if you're not careful during the mission and you lose the only cop with this perk, there is no way to reach the last 4 men on the map. Thus, you need to restart and reassign perks and hope that you've got at least one more cop that has access to it. And just to drive home the idea of poor mission design, here's another example. This is a challenging mission where you have to sneak into the necktie base, complete a series of objectives and evacuate before a bomb detonates. Almost plays out like a commander's mission, interestingly enough, all fine and dandy, actually not because it's a stealth mission with instant fail states fuck, until you realize that there's only one place to evacuate your cops out of the three that would make sense and there's no indication where would that be until you trigger the bomb and start the ticking clock. Guess who lost the maxed out officer because she couldn't make it out in time? I'm so sorry flower pots. You were so sweet when you were asking me for a weekly delivery of heroin for your snitching services. <laughs> As for how these missions play out, they're not great, but not awful either. You have the perks and assigned equipment to give you more tactical options, but in most cases your best approach is to sneak, knock out and arrest all suspects. For one, enemies' patrol routes are predictable and their vision isn't great. Sometimes it's pretty easy to clean out a room without triggering an alarm if you're methodical. But on the other hand, hostage missions have an instant fail state. You make any kind of noise and the hostages are killed. Lame. If you end up in firefights, you'll witness the AI Zerg rushing your positions. It's not precisely lame, but it's still kinda lame if you ask me. I personally ended up in this situation only twice. One when I was in an ambush mission where it made sense and another when I forgot that I took a less loyal officer with me so he ran straight to the middle of the map on his own and unsuccessfully tried to ramble his way through. Yes, there's a loyalty system and it's entirely transparent by the way. Yet another reason to care about each individual under your supervision. The fights themselves are nothing out of the ordinary. On one hand, I like them because they're straightforward. Only revolvers, oh my god, I can't pronounce this word, what the fuck? Simple ammo management and hit chances are displayed for any body part you aim for. But on the other hand, I find it disappointing that the only way to save bleeding cops is to pick them up and extract them with no first aid options at your disposal. I mean, I get it, it's a small police department in the middle of nowhere, these guys aren't exactly special forces but it means that you either mop the floor with your enemies or endure bloodbaths with nothing in between. Once you lose people because they are pinned down on the ground or are left unable to shoot back, your only chance to win is to ignore your dying officers and blast opponents as much as possible. Oh, and I'd love to see what enemies I can see with an officer if I move him to a new position before I make that move. Out of the turn-based tactical games I've played throughout my life, I know of only one game and a mod of another that provides this very basic feature. There's also a sort of economy to the police management system. 
At the end of each day, beer can tabs are awarded for each successful call, arrest or investigation. This can be used to acquire new officers and equipment. I like this approach because doing a good job daily is even more critical. Before it didn't really matter if you screwed up on some calls because you could quickly bounce back with few consequences for your past failures. Now mistakes quickly and directly impact your ability to improve your police force. There's also the money economy, which is much more important than in the last game. Your goal isn't to hoard as much money as possible, but to earn enough for Jack to pay off the guy that keeps the feds off his tail. Fail a payment and it's game over. In the original game, after being able to afford most of the more expensive and variable services, money became a non-issue. Here, you must scrape by with what you have most of the time because those payments sting quite a bit. The most money can be earned by selling items your officers requisition during their shifts. But you need to be careful not to sell everything because these items can also be used to gather information or favors. These changes significantly impacted how I enjoyed playing the sequel compared to the original game. I no longer felt like I was just passing the time because my attention is called off and with meaningful choices. There is much more thought into your decisions and turning into autopilot mode is very difficult. There are a lot of things that can go wrong and the game is less likely to hesitate in punishing you. And most important of all, it gave me a much more pronounced sentiment of just one more turn. In good part because the pacing is way better here than it was in the first game. No more front loading of important events and mechanics in a few days just to provide monotonous boredom for a lot more afterwards. I spent god knows how long hammering this complaint earlier and now that I see it addressed in the sequel I'm delighted. I'm also amazed small developers tend to fall into the same traps and mistakes more often than not. Therefore thumbs up to Weepy Studios for avoiding that. Events take place in a more natural and spread out order. Uneventful days still occur, but story cutscenes or gameplay events are peppered consistently to break the monotony. This bodes well for the story since it keeps a constant rhythm and adequately keeps you interested in it. Jack's offer to help with running the police station is shown as a gesture of goodwill given in exchange for Lily's silence. He's scared and desperate enough to even think that this would work but to his luck, she is just as desperate to make her police department work. From this uneasy agreement, an equally uneasy partnership is born. The instant he feels sheltered from danger, Jack's threatening demeanor from the end of the first game rears his ugly head. But to a certain extent, I think that Jack is less interesting now, for lack of better term. In the first game, he started as a cop humbled by the lousy cards he was dealt with and evolved into a more confident and combative individual. In This is the Police 2, he starts as a scared old man on the run, quickly switches into a mean bully and doesn't let go of that. There is a stage where he reaches the depths of despair out of fear for his own life and safety. This moment is short-lived and he immediately returns on his track of turning into what can only be described as murderous psycho. I said before that I don't believe that having an arc is mandatory for a character to be interesting and I stick to that. But when a game dedicates so much attention to making a character study of someone who goes through profound change, it's pretty deflating to have less of that in a sequel. I'm not saying that Jack Boyd is uninteresting, on the contrary. But in the original game, Jack was sympathetic, you felt sorry for him in a genuine way. Now he's turned into an utterly unlikable individual, who you can't root for unless you just want to see the protagonist be badass, which he does to his credit. But it's like the first game is season 1 to 5 of Breaking Bad, while the second game is only the last couple of episodes from season 4 and the whole of 5th. They're both intriguing, but one offers less than the other. Yeah, I know, I'm very original by making a Breaking Bad parallel in 2022, uh, sue me, I guess? The rest of the characters are also engaging in their own way. Sharpwood may be smaller than Freeburg, but there are plenty of interesting people to meet. As I already said, I won't go into spoilers, but Captain Carter's role in the game is perhaps the most important except for the main cast. His conversations with Jack are akin to a boundary marker and split the small character arc I've mentioned earlier. Yes, the one I made the argument, it isn't really noticeable. The conclusion of these interactions cuts as deep as it's saddening and represents the turning point for Jack's character. That being said, there's an observation I have to make. 
As you might have noticed, if you watched multiple videos of mine, I'm not a sound engineer by any means. I've posted so many instances where I smack my microphone or its cable during recording that it's not even funny anymore. Ok, ok, it's a little funny. But that being said, the voice recordings sound like it was done with worse equipment and settings. You can hear the noise level speaking in some instances and the dialogue overall sounds less clean than in the first game. You taking good care of the goods here, Warren? You ready for us here, Warren? Just waiting in ambush, Warren? You did fucking nothing, Warren! Fucking nothing! Because you thought we'd never come. But here I am, Warren. Here I am! You like Jack Boyd. Because with him, you don't feel lonely. On the one hand, I have no idea if the sound engineer is the same, but on the other, I doubt that the same person would bring clean, crisp sound and optimal recording settings only to mess it up three years later. After all this rambling, what can I say about This is the Police 2? Well, the improvements in gameplay are massive, even if it's not perfect. Except for the missions with instant fail states, there are no moments of deep frustration that stopped me from playing. Not only that, but the gameplay is way more engaging and fleshed out and does a great job of not feeling like window dressing. Some might not enjoy the tactical missions and I can understand why. Beyond not being very complex, they tend to eat up a lot of time, in significant part because there is no way to skip animations or make them run faster. Because of this, the idea that you could simply pick it up and play a quarter of an hour to pass an in-game day is unrealistic. And considering that you could only autosave at the start of each day, it's pretty clear that the sequel isn't a pick up and play type of game like its predecessor. But if you're interested in a story with good characters, engaging writing and quality voice acting, these two games fit the bill. They took me roughly 30 hours to go through and I don't regret spending the time with them. They're not perfect games, each has its own issues which I've gone at length to dissect. But they're distinct and unique experiences, especially from a narrative standpoint. Because of this, I'd go on a limb and recommend others to try them out as long as they're aware of the issues I've mentioned. Thanks to everyone for being here for so long. Didn't really expect to have so much to say about these two games, but I bet you ain't complaining either. And because you're not, go ahead and click the fancy buttons as fast as you dial 911 when you hear the window break in the middle of the night. And until next time, cheers!